Hi, I'm George Norrie, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Welcome back. Let's talk some UFOs. Christopher Sharp is the founder and editor-in-chief of Liberation Times, senior contributing journalist at Daily Mail. He's based in London, and he joins us live from there. Uh, Chris, great to have you here. Hi, George. Thank you so much for having me on again. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, I'll set the stage this way. The New York Times, which played such a, a pivotal role in kickstarting the, the renaissance of official interest in UFOs, with that December 2017 article, seemingly lost interest since then. It's reverted back to the attitude that it's had for 50 years, which is to belittle the subject, use a lot of sarcasm, make fun of witnesses, um, or, or more often to ignore it altogether. You know, the Washington Post, ditto. But even the Times this past week had to grudgingly cover the developments that have happened in the last couple of days. This legislation proposed by Senate Majority Leader uh, Chuck Schumer, the Times still doesn't mention the name of David Grush, who's the whistleblower that we can get into, but they did do a story. However, to get the real scoop, we have to go to you. I mean, it's interesting that we Americans would have to turn to a U.K. journalist to get the lowdown on what's happening in Washington uh, about UFO transparency. Do you find it odd? Yes, I do rather find it odd, but what a what a, what a, what an age that we live in, whereby independent journalists such as me, with independent publications, are in a position to actually get this news out to a huge audience. So I feel blessed in a way that I'm able to do that, especially in an age where a lot of the mainstream publications seem to have lost their bottle when it comes to reporting these kind of stories. Share with me your sense of wonder and awe as these bombs have been dropping one shoe after another, one development after another, statements by Marco Rubio, the legislation proposed by Chuck Schumer, the Oversight Committee planning a hearing. I mean, it is an overwhelming sense uh, of, uh, of appreciation that I have for a topic that has so long been ignored or slandered. Absolutely. It, well, a lot of people think that it started with the February shootdowns over North America. Um, however, I can confirm that I was speaking to sources before those events happened, and it was confirmed to me that there was an accelerated interest, let's say, in the topic, and that, you know, people who were visiting Washington had never, never kind of experienced the level of interest that they had before um, around, let's say, late January, Feb early February time. So I think a lot of it was kick-started for some reason um, by increased um, interest within Congress. And then you had the February shootdowns occur. And I think that's when it really, really exploded. And from my understanding, a very, very senior person within the U.S. military actually approached the Biden administration, um, basically <laughs> uh, fessing up, um, saying, look, um, not all of us have been honest with you, especially the U.S. Air Force. And um, there may be some um, legacy programs relating to exotic material that you may not know about. Uh, so all of a sudden you have the White House National Security Council setting up some kind of a UFO task force of their own to investigate it. And um, until now, the White House has been quite quiet. Um, and, you know, l last week we had this, uh, leg well, just recently we've had this re legislation drop um, from... Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, and um, it's got the White House involvement, you know, painted all over it, basically. And I was able to confirm my article that there had been some coordination between uh, the Senate, let's say, and the White House and actually getting this legislation out. And it's bombshell. And, um, you know, we have to hand it to, um, to, to David Grush because um, I think it's now acceptable to actually have a conversation about 
I, I mean, it, I, I tell you what, I used to flinch when I used to ask this question of defence contractors, but but now, you know, I, I don't have to flinch. You know, when I'm mentioning recovery of non-human technology, including craft. I mean, it's 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 amazing, you know, and I think that, you know, in the months and years to come, people will have this conversation about non-human intelligence materials and craft, and it won't be something that you'll have to be embarrassed about. It will just be normal conversation that you take for granted. Astonishing. The, the story that you posted today, you released today, the headline is this, Congress initiates plan to reveal recovered technologies of unknown origin and biological evidence of non-human intelligence. That is an astonishing headline. Can you tell us, uh, basically uh, make a synopsis of what is in the legislation proposed by Chuck Schumer, who, to my knowledge, has never made a public comment about UFOs uh, on any level? Absolutely, yes. So what this would do, this legislation is an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act, which already has UFO language, by the way, which will provide an amnesty period for defense contractors. But this goes a step further. It basically says that any materials provided, well, any materials disclosed to this um, UAP review board, as it's called, with nine U.S. citizens nominated by the president on board, um, basically they, they would have to um, they, they would have to surrender um, those materials and craft and biological evidence to the U.S. government. It's frankly astonishing. Um, there, there are other aspects to it. So it's basically stated that FOIA hasn't really been successful when it comes to this topic, and that the review board will also, you know, be charged with releasing um, UFO files and records um, dating back decades as well. So, um, I mean, this is this is really bombshell, and, and I think the definitions as well speak. For themselves, because I mean, now we're getting definitions of what non-human in intelligence means, and that's any sense of intelligent non-human life form, regardless of nature or ultimate origin, that may be presumed responsible for unidentified anomalous phenomena, or of which the federal government has become aware. I mean, we're not reading a science fiction novel here; we're reading legislation from the very top of Congress, and it's quite frankly unbelievable just reading this legislation. Senator Schumer is a savvy politician. He learned a lot from his mentor, the previous Senate Majority Leader, Harry Reid of Nevada, whom I knew well uh, over a long period of time. We had a 30-year private conversation about UFOs. I helped inform him, and he helped me in getting information for stories. Uh, Reid uh, did have conversations with Schumer, but Schumer's never acknowledged it in, in public before, and now he comes out with very dramatic language in this legislation, as well as pretty forceful statements surrounding it, uh, where he explains, I think I think they used the word non-human uh, in, in the bill or the proposed amendment something like more than 20 times, right? Correct, correct. It's all over the legislation. It, it truly is astonishing. And look, Chuck Schumer, in a press release um, from Senate Democrats, which is basically his own website, is... House Majority Leader, he's um, he's actually paid homage to Majority Leader, uh, former Majority Leader Harry Reid as well. Um, and also what I'd like to point out as well is, you know, a lot of people, a lot of debunkers like to say that this is just a small group of people. But no, I mean, in this release, it's stating that senators, congressmen, committees and staff began to pursue this issue and covered a vast web of individuals and groups with ideas and stories to share. While these stories have varying levels of credibility, the sheer number and variety has led, to, has led some in Congress to believe that the executive branch is concealing important information regarding UAPs over broad periods of time. So it's not just a small group of people, it's a vast group of people. And also I'd like to point out that Senator, Senator Rubio, um, who's vice chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, has stated that, look, we, we've got... A lot of people who've had high-level clearances, very, very important positions, um, uh, they're in a position to know a lot of stuff, and they're all coming back with the same kind of story. And um, I see no incentive to, um, you know, what is their incentive to lie, basically? And I think we're, we're reaching a critical, critical mass here now. Uh, Schumer's amendment has two Republican senators as co-sponsors, which is 
it's awesome to see that there are some issues that can be bipartisan. You know, as you mentioned about the statements, recent statements from Marco Rubio. But in your reporting, you say that he's also obviously has consulted with the White House, with the National Security Council, that Schumer would not do this on his own without talking to them about it. What what indications? How solid are your indications that he's had those conversations and that, and that at least some of them are on board? Oh, I mean, in all honesty, it could come from a better source. I'm very, very certain that that information is correct. And quite frankly, looking at the legislation, I don't think it comes as much of a surprise because we're talking about um, the, the U.S. president actually nominating persons on this um, uh, UAP review panel um, and also having discretion as well on what information does and does not get released. Quite frankly, if the president was not consulted, I'd be very, very surprised. And, um, you know, could you imagine a headline with that legislation with his name all over it that he hadn't been consulted? That would be some headline. But um, I don't think it will come as much as a surprise, and I've just confirmed that. Can you describe for us then how that part of that amendment, the proposal, would work? Uh, So a nine-member panel, uh, these would be appointed by the president, and what would they do? Oh, wow. So what, what it would be is that they would be tasked with going through all the, all the records. So um, they, they, would be, they would be helped with someone um, who is basically, it's their, it's their job to, to look through all the, all the records, basically. And they would work with them, like an archivist, basically. And they would go through all the records and all the um, different departments and agencies would be tasked with trying to get this out and the review board will basically be using their discretion of what can or what should or what should not be released. And, um, I mean, we're talking about, we're talking about one, you know, of of the members, there's an, there's an executive director or chairperson of it who's going to have like, um, because they're going to vote basically on what they do and do not release. So he's going to have like tie breaking powers but also noteworthy as well, members of this, you know, you're going to have one current or former national security official, um, no surprise, one current um, or former foreign service official, okay, that's not so much of a surprise as well, one scientist engineer, yep. But then it starts to get interesting, because then you have one economist, and it's been suggested to me that you'll have an economist on board, because if information is so bombshell and shocking you have to account for the impact that this might have on the stock market and the global economy. You also have a professional historian as well. So yeah, that kind of makes sense. But then it's the last one that really, really is quite shocking in a way, and it's one sociologist. Because when you're actually going to disclose this information, if it is shocking again, you're going to have to take into account the impacts in society that this may have. Um, and from my understanding as well, in terms of legislation, this review board can also create um, a committee, an adv- advisory committee, basically. Um, and that opens up the possibility that they could perhaps um, create a committee of um, faith leaders, perhaps from different religions, to discuss implications of disclosing um, certain pieces of information. And I think that's, um, that, that's really, really important to take into account here. I mean, we're so- talking something that is really, really huge, huge story. In, in essence, the, the legislation, if it passes in the current form, it would require basically the entirety of the federal government to cough up whatever they've got. If you've got UFO files, we want to see them. Correct. And then this board appointed by the president would sift through it and decide what the public gets to see, right? Is that basically how it works? Yeah, yeah, that's it. And there's oversight of this, uh, this review board as well from the... Um, the Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs. So they're going to have oversight of this committee as well, and, and there'll be, there'll be um, hearings in terms of <clears throat> members being appointed, just like you do with, um, you know, with ev- any other kind of like um, person who's nominated for a government position from the president. So um, there's that, as- that aspect as well. And if it passes, I expect it to pass. If it passes in its current form... What will happen is that I think they'll have 90 days then. So I think that takes us up to April 2024 um, that the president has then to nominate people um, on that review board. Wow. Because that legislation will usually pass before um, January 1st, 2024. 
Well, as you know, we're kind of conspiracy minded around this place, so I'm always looking for the dark cloud and the silver lining. Um, this nine member panel, we've had heard it compared to the JFK Commission, which has released a great deal of stuff, but as we all know, they haven't released the final batch of documents even after you know all these years, six decades after the assassination. So I can see some people worrying, well, if it's modeled after that, then there might be a heck of a lot of UFO stuff that still won't get released. What's your sense on on how that might be, how Senator Schumer or his supporters might answer that? Sure. Well, I, I, I can say from from my perspective, definitely, that there is huge political momentum and pressure uh, to get this information out, and that's especially been true in terms of the DOD feeling the heat from Congress. I would say that it's different in that way from JFK because, I mean, we're talking about a, an event which is obviously noteworthy and very, very important to get to the bottom of in terms of the JFK assassination. That happened decades ago, though. Um, in terms of the UAP issue, we're talking about something right under the noses of Congress, um, which is basically, um, you know, if such programs do exist, special access programs relating to UAP and crash craft and stuff, we're talking about illegal programs. Um, you know, it's so important because we're, without democratic oversight, is it really a functioning democracy? And I'd also point out as well that if such programs do exist, it is definitely in the U.S. government's interest to make this, these programs public to a certain extent in that they can get these crafts studied by a wider group of scientists and engineers, because at the moment, to get the clearances to work on such materials, it's very, very difficult. I mean, for example, if you're a scientist or an engineer, you couldn't have done drugs to actually get the clearances to study such craft. And I can tell you that some of the greatest scientists and engineers have done drugs, uh, which may come as a surprise. Um, but it's so restrictive that it hinders, you know, our ability to make progress studying these crafts and you know, find new technologies that could help with key issues that are of fundamental importance, such as, you know, new technologies to uh, mitigate the impact of climate change um, and perhaps as well to, um, you know, new propulsion systems that will help us get into the stars and explore the cosmos. It's of vital importance. You know, part of me would like to be sympathetic to the Pentagon in how this has all played out. You know, the the big UFO, modern UFO age starts right after World War II. We've just come through this horrendous conflict, global conflict. Millions of people had died. And then this new challenge appears in the skies, and we have no idea what it is. So I can see them worrying about uh, what they wanted to say about it back then, but um, they've They've painted themselves in a corner and never come clean with us. We're talking with Chris Sharp of Liberation Times about these recent astonishing developments in UFO transparency. We've been hearing from Chris Sharp about one part of the proposed amendment from Senator Schumer, which would provide for the release of previously classified UFO files from across the entire federal government. But the other part of this proposal is even more interesting. It addresses crash retrievals, intact craft of non-human origin, and maybe bodies. If you've got it, essentially, let's have it. That's what it says. More on that in just a moment. Chris Sharp, before the break, I was uh, expressing sympathy for the Pentagon to some degree in that right after World War II, these things appear in our skies. They fly circles around our best technology. They appear and disappear. They, they mess with our nuclear weapons programs. And uh, it must have been pretty frightening. And I can understand maybe the Pentagon, maybe the presidents in that time didn't want to release this information because they didn't really know what's going on. I suspect we still really don't know what's going on, that there aren't many people, if any, that know the ultimate answer to what's going on. But over the decades, our military, our governments lied to the public so much that they painted themselves into a corner. And once the lies stacked up to the ceiling, they just couldn't admit that they'd been dishonest all this time. Now, there are attempts to make them fess up. And I wonder if, if you have a sense of whether the keepers of the secrets are ready to give in or whether they're going to fight this tooth and nail every step of the way, especially this part about giving up the crash retrieval stuff and exposing reverse engineering programs. Well, if we listen to David Grush, this dates back to 1933 when a craft crashed on Italian soil. 
um, I recently reported um, this story for the Daily Mail because we found new testimony from someone um, whose great-great-grandfather was a mayor in a local town nearby where the crash happened. Um, and that person said, as the story goes, there were also two occupants in that craft um, that had blonde hair. Um, and if we're to believe the story, um, that craft, um, was taken to the United States, perhaps after the, after the Second World War. Um, and in terms of the secret keepers, yeah, I, I, from my understanding, I, I think, you know, I, I think we, we could perhaps, let's say, expect more and more people um, to start using those whistleblower te- protections coming forward to Congress. Um, I think we can expect more and more of those people to come forward. And also I'd point out as well that, um, you know, the the great journalist Michael Schellenberger um, reported that, um, excuse me, sorry, that um, back in the, um, um, that back in 2010, um, a defense contractor, a major aerospace corporation, um, was trying to get this out in terms of um, getting the craft studied by, by more people, basically, scientists and engineers. And very, very rudely, they were told no. Um, uh, so I, I think that may have been Lockheed, let's say. Um, and I think there is, I think there are secret keepers that have wanted this out for, um, for quite a long time now. And they may have even played a crucial part in getting us to where we are right now, I'd go so far as saying. You know, uh, you've been in contact with Lockheed. You get a mixed reaction from them. Uh, they kick it back and forth. They play this game of, of patty cake where you ask the DOD and they tell you to ask Arrow and you ask Arrow and they, you know, they defer you to Lockheed and Lockheed kicks you back to Arrow kind of a thing. That's the games that you've been dealing with and try to get to the bottom of this, right? Yes, correct. So I've been in um, conversation with Lockheed Martin for the past few weeks now um, because if they do have illegal programs relating to UAP, that is a material risk to shareholders that they would perhaps have to disclose under um, SEC corporate disclosure laws. I asked them about that, and they basically referred me to the Department of Defense. So they want the U.S. Department of Defense to ask, answer questions about them with perhaps withholding stuff from their shareholders. I don't quite understand how that works. However, I did manage to get a line from them saying that we do comply with all regulatory requirements. Um, But I'm getting some very, very odd responses from Lockheed, let's say. Um, Although, uh, all credit to Lockheed because, you know, I I have asked Patel, BAE Systems, Northrop Grumman, among others as well, and all have failed to to respond. So um, hats off to Lockheed for at least responding and engaging with me. You'd think that uh, if they had that technology, if they had an intact saucer uh, from somewhere else, non-human, other planets, other dimensions, whatever it is, and even if they haven't figured out how they work, just possessing that technology would be incredibly valuable. I don't even think you could put a dollar figure on it because of the promise of what it could represent. I can see people in in a company like that being unwilling to give it up, no matter what the legislation might say. That's correct. That's correct. But also you could make the argument as well that the best engineers at the moment in the industry are perhaps going to SpaceX and um, cooler companies, let's say, um, that are attracting, you know, um, generation, um, generation, I think it's Z, isn't it, and, um, and millennials. And um, perhaps Lockheed isn't getting the best talent anymore. So perhaps it may, perhaps disclosure to a certain extent may actually help them and bolster recruitment. Um, so there's a whole bunch of arguments, but also it's state as well that, you know, if the government can take these craft from Lockheed Martin, then, you know, you can imagine that there must be some compensation Um, relating to that. And also, you can imagine as well, there must be some tender process. The U.S. government can't just take craft from such organizations and just say, okay, we're just going to keep them there. No, there would need to be some kind of tendering process. So you can imagine that, you know, other companies that haven't had access to these, perhaps Radiance, let's say, um, may be tendering for um, such craft to actually study them. Um, But 
I also would say as well, I think it's of vital importance to protect Lockheed to a certain extent because, you know, without Lockheed, if, if it fell in one day, Lockheed, I mean, that would be the defences of the Western yeah. allied countries yeah. put in jeopardy. So that's of vital importance as well. So it, it needs to be done very, very carefully. Yeah, for sure. Lockheed Martin is critical to our national security, for sure. You know, we're almost through the looking glass here with this Schumer Amendment. Because for decades, this whole idea has been dismissed as some kind of UFO folklore. I mean, I've been reporting stories about Area 51 for 34 years, taking a lot of crap about those reports. But now it doesn't look so crazy. And Roswell, you know, people have investigated that even longer. The the granddaddy of, of crash retrieval stories, in a sense, Wright Patterson, Hangar 18, all dismissed as nonsense. There's no evidence for it. Suddenly, the entire playing field has flipped on its head because of language in that proposed amendment uh, that Senator Schumer signed off on that you say the White House also agreed on, talking about non-human technology, about, you know, implying crash retrievals and maybe bodies. I mean, wow, it, it's an astonishing moment. Absolutely astonishing. Absolutely. And also, is it not astonishing as well that the chair of the House Intelligence Committee, who happens to represent right past an Air Force base, that that committee has no UAP language in its version of the Intelligence Authorization Act. And that, you know, chairperson of the committee who represents right past an Air Force base has gone on live TV to downplay this whole UAP thing. Isn't that really, isn't that really strange? And I've got a photograph of um, Mike Turner, who, that's his name, um, with General McCasland, who... Um, a lot of people would suggest has a lot to do with um, getting this whole disclosure effort started. Um, and I would also just point out one more thing as well. I think that, let's say, I think that rumors are circulating amongst um, staff members at Wright Patterson Air Force Base that there may be some bodies stored in some freezers somewhere. That wouldn't surprise me. Those kind of stories have been around a long time. Sure, it'd be nice to get a look at them, or at least some pictures of them. Um, I, I, you have to admit, I, I think you would agree with the assessment that Dave Grush is responsible for moving this ball down the field, that his testimony coming out, you know, it's been delivered behind closed doors under oath for a long time. We know that Sean Kirkpatrick, the head of RO, is aware of it. And yet after Dave Grush's testimony is known, Mr. Kirkpatrick, Dr. Kirkpatrick says, I've seen no credible evidence that any of this stuff is real, that we have, you know, non-human technology somewhere. Um, obviously, Senator Schumer seems thing, sees things differently, and he hinted it in m- many cases that there are many witnesses who've come forward who've shared similar information. Is that your understanding? Yes, that's correct. Many individuals have come forward. Perhaps people that are, nat- uh, that are known nationally to the American people as well. I mean, we're talking high-profile people, from my understanding, who have no incentive to lie, let's say. And I would also point out as well, in terms of the DOD's responses on this, the Arrow hasn't verified that anything has been found of non of extraterrestrial origin. So I managed to confirm with Susan Goff, the Pentagon spokesperson, that that also covers non-human origin. However, what I don't know yet, I have asked this question, is whether this term also includes and covers a known origin and it's very, very funny that the term unknown origin is covered and defined in this new legislation. <laughs> so that technology is of unknown origin. So it's any materials or metamaterials, materials, ejector, crash debris, mechanisms, machinery, equipment, assemblies or sub-assemblies, engineering models or processes, damaged or intact aerospace vehicles and damaged or intact ocean surface and undersea craft associated with UAP or incorporating science and technology that lacks prosaic attribution or known means of human manufacture. And I would also point out a key term as well used in the Pentagon's jargon, well, it's response, let's say, is um, verifiable, basically, or verified. So let's just say that you're Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, that you find a program that's been, you know, um, made aware, you've been made aware of for a whistleblower, and you do find, you know, stuff that may be of non-human origin. Well, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick can't just say, well, so-and-so tells me it's of non-human origin. They'll have to verify that independently. And and how do you actually 
prove that it's extraterrestrial, for example, right. as well. Right. It's yeah. So these are these are questions, and these are things that the Pentagon can hide behind as well when providing their public responses. Tell me this. Uh, does this legislation apply to just regular everyday people, individuals? Uh, you know, we've heard stories about folks even recently going out to what they think was the Rashwell crash, Roswell crash site and finding little bits and pieces of seemingly anomalous material. Dr. Gary Nolan has talked about having several samples that have been undergoing analysis for a while. Jacques Vallée has said the same. you got to figure there might be military folks or former defense contractors, retirees, who've stashed bits and pieces here and there, would individual citizens be required to cough it up? If you've got something that's weird, you got to give it to your government. Yes, yes. Well, let's just say that individual citizens have played a major role in getting us to where we are. You know, you know. big shout out to yourself and Jeremy Corbell, who have been an immense help for me. Um, and yes, in terms of the Intelligence Authorization Act language, which has been drafted by... The Senate Intelligence Committee, it uses the terms persons in terms of the amnesty language relating to UAP materials. So I would say that it may be a good idea to actually, you know, may, maybe call um, your lawyer <laughs> if you do uh-huh. hold such materials uh-huh. to get advice on this and how to come forward and what the potential repercussions could be if you fail to do so once this, le- this legislation passes. You touched on this briefly, but you think it will pass. In the, in the form that Sh- Schumer has proposed? I mean, I, I don't like to say, I, I don't like to approach things in a black and white way by saying yes or no, but I would say I'm probably about 80% certain it will. Whenever you get these amendments and whatnot, it, some, some of the language falls by the wayside um, a lot of times, so we'll get excited during the summer that this language is being included. But come, come December, once the House and the Senate have to basically come together and say, you know, whose version, you know, is going to um, be included within the National Defense Authorization Act or Intelligence Authorization Act, they have to make compromises, negotiations. Sometimes that means that some language does fall by the wayside. But I would state that this language has a very, very good chance in passing in terms of what Schumer has proposed. He is the... Med- He is the Senate majority leader. And also from my understanding as well, like we said, you know, it seems as though there has, well, there has, and I've had that confirmed, been coordination with the White House. So, you know, Democrats all have cover now in terms of actually speaking out about this because, you know, the guys at the top said it's okay and they're actually on the case themselves. So I would say there's a very, very good chance. And as you mentioned before, there is bipartisan support as well. This is not just a Democrat issue. This is not just a Republican issue. This is a bipartisan issue. And isn't it amazing, the times that we live in at the moment, with all the divides and whatnot, and all the culture wars, that on this very one topic, it seems that both Republicans and Democrats are coming together. It's simply amazing. I've seen comments, uh, people write this on, on Twitter, and it's it's pretty poignant. They will say, isn't it amazing that we're on the verge of what might be a time when, you know, you could say to your kids, I lived on the planet when we thought humans were the only intelligence here or were the top of the food chain, and now we know that's not true, And which would be a p- pretty astonishing change to uh, sweep over the planet. You, you have a quote from Senator Schumer where he says in your article, where he says the American public has a right to learn about technologies of unknown origins, non-human intelligence, and unexplainable phenomena. Astonishing verbiage there. Is there anything that you have heard in any of your reporting that maybe you feel the public should not know, something that would be so upsetting that would change the world in such a tectonic level that maybe it shouldn't come out? I think that... Look, once once we can confirm for sure that these programs do exist, the craft exists, then we're going to have to move on to another conversation about the occupants, about the intelligences themselves, you know, and I, and I believe there are multiple intelligences visiting this Earth. Um, and I think that might be a very, very uncomfortable conversation to have, you know, because you have reports that some craft have just been found with the doors open, but no one there. 
intact, and it seems that the occupants have left. So where did they go? Also, we have reports as well of an incident that happened at Holloman Air Force Base, um, which was actually filmed in terms of a UAP, um, well, craft landing, and um, let's just say non you know, aliens, basically, um, getting out of the craft and engaging with U.S. Air Force officers. So you have to ask yourself if that is correct, if that does exist, that footage, and it did happen, what's happened with that communication? Was any, were any agreements made? Has contact been kept? If that contact has been kept, who with? Who are they? What do they want? What is their agenda? Yeah. And I think more uncomfortably as well, you know, um, your friend um, um, Rob, Robert Bigelow said that, you know, they may be living amongst us. And I think that might be rather uncomfortable. Yeah. I mean, even if we cross the threshold to learn about non-human technologies and crash saucers, reverse engineering bodies, we still really don't know. I don't know anyone who does know, and I've been pretty far up the food chain. I don't know anyone who knows who they are, where they're from, why they're here, or for sure what their interest is in us. But those are some exciting program, uh, uh, questions to get to the bottom of. Chris Sharp, there's, there's so many different developments, all assorted kind of things breaking on this topic. It's hard to keep up with them all. Someone just had sent me a, uh, a, a tweet about Barack Obama, former president who has joined with Netflix in the production of a film about the Betty and Barney Hill case. And if you had told me 10 years ago that was going to happen, I would have said you're crazy. But, you know, because Barack Obama wasn't exactly the disclosure president. Uh, you know, there were citizen petitions that were submitted to him when he was in the White House. 25,000 or more people signed it, and he basically brushed it off. The White House did, saying there's there's no evidence. Since these revelations of the past couple of years, though, he's been much more forthcoming. It's it's an amazing um, period of transition, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. And my good friend, Marek von Renningkamp, who writes The Hill, actually, oh, yeah. uh, used to work with uh, Barack Obama, and um, I, I do say to him now and then, please uh, please transmit the news and what's going on, <laughs> and also try and get a quote from Barack as well. I um, haven't had much success yet, but um, we'll see how we get on. As you have noted in your reporting, uh, you know, it is a bipartisan issue to a large extent. In the Senate, you've now got Chuck Schumer and Marco Rubio, uh, Kirsten Gillibrand uh, and Mark Warner and uh, out in front on this issue, making very bold public statements in the House. I, I think the leadership uh, has come mostly from the Republican side, but not exclusively. Tim Burchett. Um, I know a lot of Democrats don't like Tim Burchett because of his position on other issues. He's a very conservative guy from from uh, Tennessee. But on this issue, man, he's been a champion. And and he is for he's sort of leading the charge for a hearing. What can you tell us about that? So that there is supposed to be a hearing that's going to take place on July the 26th. Um, from my understanding, it's about 95% certain that it will be that date, but there may be some just last pieces of detail, let's say, that they have to um, discuss first before that can officially be announced. Um, it may be the Oversight Committee. It, it most likely will be the Oversight Committee, but the question we have to ask is, would it be the actual House Oversight Committee itself that the public hearing takes place? Or will it be one of its subcommittees? Um, and also in terms of witnesses as well, I mean, I have no knowledge on witnesses, uh, but um, let's just say that um, I expect the witnesses to be bombshell and I expect them not to be bureaucrats like we've had for the previous hearings. I expect it to be people who have actually got first-hand experience we're dealing with UAP and can actually help educate the public in terms of what we're actually dealing with. Well, I can tell you, I do have a certain amount of insight into who the witnesses will be, at least uh, some of them, and uh, it should be pretty good stuff. Uh, but just for the House to have this, and and Representative Burchett has promised it will be bipartisan, that there's going to be a Democrat or two on there to help ask questions and hear the testimony. So that's encouraging. Uh, I, you know, they, the the uh, it is a rare issue in Washington where you can have support for something on both sides of the aisle because they basically don't agree on anything anymore. Absolutely. And, you know, the White House has now signaled its support for looking into the UAP topic. So, again, Democrats have cover now to actually be more upfront about discussing this 
key issue. And I think this hearing is going to be theatre. I think it's going to be political theatre. All the best hearings throughout history have always had an element of political theatre in terms of drama and shocking bombshells. And I think that's what we can expect from this hearing. Not Again, not just something with a, you know, a bureaucrat who's trying to give the most boring answer that they possibly can in discussing nuances in terms of, you know, what about this bit of funding, what about that bit of funding? Although I would also say that funding is key, especially for the Arrow. But I think what the public has always expected from hearings in terms of UAP is something more dramatic. And I think that we can expect that from this hearing. And I do know that the people who are advocating this issue on the in, from the inside do want something reminiscent of the Church Committee, which exposed things such as MK Ultra. And um, it would not surprise me at this point, in terms of my assessment, if we do arrive at that destination of having a Church Committee in terms of investigating all the illegal programs that have been hidden from Congress. Um, and, I, and I think also following this hearing as well, I think we can expect more hearings to come, um, perhaps again from Burchett, um, but maybe from other committees within both the House and the, the Senate as well. I think it would require that. Uh, the Church Committee, of course, went on for a, a period of time, had multiple co- uh, hearings in, in public, and the testimony was uh, riveting, of course. And, and I think that this topic certainly would need uh, that kind of exposure because there's so much to cover. Don't you agree? Absolutely. And uh, I, I think we are we are getting to this destination now. And um, I think we can have some pretty big names perhaps showing up at some of these hearings in terms of public officials. And you- um, I think in many people's minds, that's when it's going to start to feel really real, where household names in terms of previous administrations, um, start speaking out about this. But look, it's time to cut, It's time for this to come out, you know, and I think our good friend Jeremy Corbell has put the question out there to us saying, you know, what's triggered all this? You know, why all of a sudden are we getting Chuck Schumer um, putting out this legislation? Why are we getting hearings? What has triggered all this? You know, they these are really, really big politicians. They won't just go out on a dime in terms of this. You know, they would need to have some compelling information that has made them do this. Right. And um, I think that's what we're seeing the fruits of now. What do you think happens to Arrow in the wake of all of this? They're sort of on the sideline of all the action that's taking place. You know, they. You know, they, Arrow has basically been a pretty big disappointment to folks uh, on my side of this issue who were hoping that it would be... Uh, uh, more affirmative in in what it gets done on this, and the statements from Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick have really been disappointing. So I wonder if you've given any thought to what role they will have in the, in the new landscape if all this legislation passes. Gosh, it looks pretty bleak. If I'm Kirkpatrick at this point, I'm thinking about resigning. Yeah, I mean, he's almost left in an impossible situation. I mean, even if he did want to really get to the bottom of this. He is hamstrung because the Arrow is still, despite the law saying otherwise, still reporting operationally, from my understanding, to um, the the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security, um, which is Moultrie. And, um, you know, that is the office that has been widely accused of basically intimidating whistleblowers. And... It's really astonishing that you still have them taking ownership of the arrow. Um, you know, it just begs the question, you know, if you did want to make progress on this and you were Kirkpatrick, could you, you know, with the track record of this office that it sits within? Um, so, yeah, it, it would not surprise me at this point if the, if Kirkpatrick did, did resign. And look, this new legislation, this um, new review board, um, a lot of its activities would actually uh, mimic what or reflect what the Arrow does, you know, such as speaking to um, to witnesses of UAP events. And um, I, I, I really, I really am a little bit afraid at the moment for Kirkpatrick and the fate of the Arrow because they are tasked with investigating active cases, new, new cases in terms of UAP sightings 
and historic ones as well. So if Kirkpatrick leaves, you know, does that derail what the Arrow is doing in terms of these ongoing investigations? Um, well, but I, I suppose the key to that would be his replacement. Well, we don't really know what they're doing because uh, we don't know what their staff is. We don't know what their budget is. They don't exactly release a lot of information or reports. Uh, the public uh, doesn't really have a clear picture of what the heck they're up to. And I already reported a couple of months ago before these big developments that Kirkpatrick was likely to leave at the end of the year, even before all these things happened. So uh, my my uh, prediction hasn't changed. Let me ask you one more question before we go, go to the phones. You mentioned Susan Goff, who is the single person at the Department of Defense who is authorized and allowed to answer questions about UAP, UFO matters. What is that working relationship like? Because a lot of people in my line of work do not have a good working relationship there. And we've we've had to basically figure out trick ways to get other people to ask her questions on our behalf. So is it a productive relationship? Do you run into roadblocks? What's it like? It is a very productive relationship. Um, I don't know. I can't explain how because I can't say that I've entirely been nice to her. For example, um, you know, when word was getting around that Lou was working with the Space Force, for months, you know, citizens and journalists were saying, look, Susan, can you confirm this? And they were getting nowhere. Uh, so I basically, uh, I, I started speaking to Sue and I said, look, I'm launching a formal complaint um, in terms of you. And the press office not getting back to me in terms of this simple question, does Louis Lozondo have a role within Space Force? After launching that complaint, I got an answer. You know, and it was the same as well in terms of definition of um, extraterrestrial. Um, I basically stated that they weren't, they weren't giving me information. They, they couldn't deny that it included non-human intelligence. And because I did that, it bounced the Pentagon into actually confirming that it did include non-human intelligences. Uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's been a mixed bag uh, for a lot of journalists who deal with, with that office. Uh, so I'm glad you've had at least a little bit of success. Let's take a call or two. On the wild card line, we go to Ranger Sean in Washington State. Hi, Sean. What's on your mind? Hey, George. I just, first of all, I want to tell you that I am a huge fan. I uh, just am really thankful for all the investigative work that you've done and the time that you've done um, or you put in uh, investigating all of the paranormal stuff. I will, I'm, this is how old I am, George. I loved your Chupacabra story. <laughs> <laughs> that goes so, back a ways. Uh, and <laughs> just to qualify myself, uh, I was a... Uh, but I was in the Army for 33 years. I spent a little bit over 11 years with the 2nd Ranger Battalion. Oh. Um, I stayed in the special operations community, and when the Forever War happened, I spent a large part of my time in Afghanistan. But one of the things that happened to me, especially after we got put under the uh, JSOC umbrella, was that Ground Branch, which is CIA's military arm, would come and recruit uh, specific people um, to go and do these recovery uh, missions. I was on a couple of those. One was in Arizona, and the other one, the other one was in Alaska. Actually, I think it was in British Columbia, but I don't know that for sure. Um, I, I never saw anything. They were, there was concentric rings of security, and those of us that were not part of that group were kept on the outer ring so that we just didn't see anything at all, and, and you, on those types of ops, you never get any information regarding what you're doing or where you're going, but I, I, working with that group, I know that they were picking up something that didn't belong to us, and I also was with that group on two different occasions where they used faux uh, UFOs for whatever reason over some pretty significant uh American cities now. Yeah, like a diversion or a, a training exercise. What was it? Well, I think it was a training exercise for us, but I think it was also them doing research on how is these how is this large group of people going to react when they see something like that, like Phoenix. I believe wholeheartedly that that was American uh, military, CIA, or whoever whoever it is that that shadow government that's dealing with all of these. I think that was definitely their largest operation to date when they can take. A craft that large, drive it right over the top of Phoenix, and have, I mean, people with, with, that are serious civic leaders 
reaching out, crying out, going, what is this? What is going on? And getting no answers at all. Yeah, that just reeks of the government. Because if it was an alien, they would, we, were, we would be going to war, and you know, red, white, and blue, and all of that stuff, right? So I just have a hard time believing that that wasn't a military operation, and that they continue to do those. Like Louis Elizondo, or I don't even know. Elizondo, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't trust that guy at all. I, he just reeks of, of a CIA case officer. Uh, you just uh, And then you try to nail him down on anything that he spent all of that money on. And all he's got is, are, are, are videos that were going to be leaked by those pilots anyway. So, I'd have to disagree with you there, Sean, because I think where we are right now, all those developments, to some extent, they, they they wouldn't have happened without Lou Elizondo stepping forward and sharing the information that he did. Maybe it would have happened in some other way, but it didn't. It happened because of him. But let me ask you this. You got glimpses of what you think were some sort of a, a military retrieval program. If you had solid information, would you as a whistleblower come forward? Would you feel comfortable talking about it to people like, Chris or me or Congress? Well, I'm not even sure. I'm not going to get a phone call talking to you about Ground Branch. Uh, yeah, I absolutely would. One, you know, one of the things that um, that they look at when they recruit guys like us for jobs like like that is is our patriotism. They also look, and this is kind of odd, but they to a man. Uh, one of the operations groups that I was involved with, to a man, we were we all have deep spiritual backgrounds. What that's about, I'm not sure, but. You know, I also know that, you know, I have a friend of mine that's a psychologist that vets people for law enforcement, and they look when they, you know, recruit somebody for law enforcement and they do that psych exam, they want them on the borderline of being, there's the crook and the cop are like one degree separation in the personality matrix. <laughs> because without that ability, they want, there would be a good catching crooks, right? So they need them. And then the CIA, I know for a fact that the CIA Specifically, when they recruit case officers, want people that are almost a sociopath and are, what is that, um, the one where, uh, oh, narcissist, narcissistic, because they need someone that will pull off some crazy move in the front of God and everybody, and people will think there's no way he did that because there were so many people around. You know thanks, I mean? thanks for sharing your thoughts with us, Sean. I want to bring Chris back into this conversation uh, because you've raised some interesting uh, points. Uh, Chris, would you, the current whistleblower protections that, that exist now, do you think that they are strong enough to encourage people to come forward or to whistleblowers, after hearing Sean Kirkpatrick, have to worry about whether it's a good idea or not? <clears throat> I, think, I think they're worried about coming to the arrow and Kirkpatrick because... I mean, it doesn't even seem that they're taking notes when they're giving testimony to the Arrow, and sometimes they're done in terms of this testimony taken um, through unsecure phone lines. Um, so that is deeply troubling. But look, um, from, from my understanding, a lot of whistleblowers may actually be choosing to go directly to Congress and, and bypassing the Arrow. Um, Senator Gillibrand has already said that whistleblowers um, she, she said on, on, on Matt Ford's um, show that whistleblowers can actually come forward speaking to her office instead. Chris, I want to mention one other definition that you include in your most recent article, and then we'll go back to the phones. But you have another definition in there of technologies of unknown origin are defined as any materials or metamaterials, ejecta, crash debris, mechanisms, machinery, equipment, assemblies or subassemblies engineering models or processes, damaged or intact aerospace vehicles, and damaged or intact ocean surface and undersea craft associated with UAP, or incorporating science and technology that lacks prosaic attribution or known means of human manufacture. I mean, it's almost funny how far they have gone with this language to try to cut off any ways to wiggle around it. I think, and um, they know all the tricks they may be using so they can actually evade these questions and evade perhaps, let's say, the truth that we are dealing with non-human intelligences and craft materials that do not have a prosaic explanation. They've had some good advice from somebody uh, in crafting this. Absolutely. 
absolutely. <laughs> Someone knows all the tricks that the Pentagon is playing in terms of actually answering questions and being honest. Um, hopefully, quite soon, I may be able to get confirmation on whether the Arrow has found anything of unknown origin. Uh, so I'll keep you all updated if I do find anything else out from Susan Goff. Sure. I, I wonder if you can give us the view from the U.K. about what's happening in the U.S. I know the Daily Mail covers these issues, but other than that, is any uh, British media paying attention, doing any actual in-depth reporting? No, not really. Um, you do have big, big publications like The Telegraph uh, reporting on it, but more or less their stories are relegated to the bottom. They're like basically cut, cut and paste stories um, and they're not really actually doing any investigation into them or giving them any prominence at all within their publications, uh, which is quite a sad situation. But um, I, I would say that um, our recent story, or your recent story, which I reported on, in terms of the Five Eyes um, recovery materials alleged program involving UAP, um, I did contact the UK MOD uh, regarding this, and um, the response that I got wasn't usual, let's say. It was quite abnormal compared to what I usually get when I ask UAP questions. They seemed to panic um, when I started asking questions about that. Um, uh, so I think something's up. I, I think that politicians are taking an interest. Um, there may be truth behind um, suggestions that AUKUS, an alliance between Australia, um, the UK and the US, may be looking to release information um, relating to UAP, as suggested by Larry Maguire from Canada, the politician. Um, I will say, I will say um, an interesting story, though, a quick one. Um, I was contacted by a young journalist from Cornwall recently, which is southwest England, in terms of um, advice and stuff in relation to reporting on the UAP topic. And um, they mentioned there, their, um, this person mentioned that his granddad took an interest in UAP. And um, I asked who his granddad was. And um, his granddad happened to be Sir John Knott. Um, so Sir John Knott was the former Defence Secretary oh. under Margaret Thatcher. Oh. And he was appointed to that position days after the Rendlesham Forest incident. And uh, he just tells me that um, he thinks, well, I, I, always, I won't expand too much, but let's just say Sir John Knott does seem to be asking questions about UAP. And um, I'll leave it at that. Well, I look forward to seeing that story in the Liberation Times. We'll go back to the phones. Uh, Dr. Walk in Victorville, California. Hi, doctor. What's on your mind? Yeah, so I was trying to... I've been a ufologist, a private ufologist, for 50 to 60 years when I was five years old. I met extraterrestrials when I was five years old before I to start school. And they showed me, they did a demonstration. They showed me their ability to create a localized field where time slows down. It slows down to zero. It doesn't go all the way back to zero. And uh, my background, I was a hospital pharmacist. For 30 years, and I did work in Las Vegas, too, at the Lake Mead Hospital. Back then, it was called Community North Las Vegas Hospital. And I worked in hospital pharmacies in California, all over California. So I had a 30-year career. I'm basically retired, but I've been a ufologist. And uh, I would like to, uh, for Christopher Sharp, I'd like to ask him, if there should be legal amnesty to direct extraterrestrial contactees and ufologists, but I'm a private ufologist, so I don't write books. And the reason I don't do that is because I had the men in black approach me several times. The last time was 2009. And they, they know if I move, they know where I live. So the reason nobody knows about me, including people in ufology. But I did go to the contact in the desert for Friday recently, and I gave my documents to Nick Pope, Richard Dolan, Paul Hynek, and Michael Schratt. I had documents that prove the back engineering program that went way, way back to the 1930s. And I have hard evidence that they back engineered electrogravedics a long time ago. And 
and it could have been back uh, even earlier, like 1890s, the Tesla material. Nikola Tesla was working on electric Gavitics, but they broke into his lab in New York City and they burned down his lab, but they took all his scientific research papers out. Now, we don't know if it's a private group, like a private German group or and a foreign government, but all Tesla's work was confiscated. He had electrogavitics. I tell you what, Doctor, let's, uh, let's, you've got a lot to chew on here, so let's whittle it down just a bit. I, I want to get Chris's reaction. Chris, I think uh, the primary question was asking about whether private citizens who have sensitive information would need their own form of whistleblower protection. Um, uh, doctor, I would think that the only way that would be true is if you uh, purloined material, classified stuff out of a, a government program, but uh, maybe Chris has another thought on it. Yeah, I would say that unless you've done anything illegal or been involved in anything illegal, um, I, I would say that you, you should be free to, to speak. You know, maybe you can contact a representative um, just to put your story on, on the record, basically. And um, it's interesting what you say about time slowing down. I mean, there have been reports that um, naval aviators have been in the skies and they have lost track of time. Um, and there, there are there are sensors and there is, there is uh, measurable equipment to basically give some veracity to to those claims, basically. Um, and that's when they're quite close to to craft. Um, so, so that's quite interesting you mentioned that. Yeah, if you have definitive evidence, make it public or send it to your elected members in, of Congress. Uh, but if it needs to come out, hope you'll take the steps to to share it. Hey, if you want to share it with me, I'll take a look at it. Uh, thanks for the call. We're going to Ken in Idaho. Hi, Ken. Good morning. You're on with Chris Sharp of Liberation Times. Hi, George. Um, hey, um, I, I believe that that this whole thing is is a ruse. I think that the, the, the government, the one world government in particular, wants everybody to think that, they, first of all, they're trying to, to force everybody to believe that there's aliens, which I don't believe. I think there's angels and demons. I totally believe that. But I think that they want everyone to, to believe that they're the only ones that can talk to them. They don't want any private people talking to them if they're, you know, because they don't want anybody to find out that it's all a lie. Um, because I think that they're going to have, they're going to stage an attack. They have, uh, they have technology that they can, uh, you know, project uh, holograms and and make it look real. It's going to be a, a great a way to divide the people against each other. Okay. Well, who's going to launch this attack? Like the COVID thing was used. I'm sorry. Go who's going to launch the attack? Yeah, there's going to be an attack, and From the whom? government is going to be the only one that can talk to them. You know, the government's going to say, "Well, we're in contact with them." You know, we're, we, you know, you have to do what we tell you to do. It's going to be used in the way that the COVID thing was used to take control over everybody. That's well, what I, I think is coming. I think yeah. I totally believe that there's angels and demons and there's forces that beyond our imagination out there. But I don't think that aliens, um, I mean, all we have basically is some, is some photos and Photoshop stuff. We don't have any hard core evidence. I mean, body parts that anybody's actually seen in real life. Well, I don't know that that's true anymore, Ken. We, we've heard some uh, testimony from David Grush about other people who've already appeared before Congress under oath who say they have had hands-on experience. But you're right. We haven't seen it yet. And uh, if this is a plot, it's taken a really long time to unveil it. Chris, you want to respond to any of that? No, absolutely. So, yeah, if I do find any information corroborating those claims, obviously I'll look to um, I'll look to, to report it. Basically, if I can find anything um, compelling um, relating to that, um, and that's where I go. I, I go where the where the evidence takes me. Basically, as a reporter. So, look, I, I don't take anything off the table, and um, if it is true, then I will look to report it. I would add this, Ken, is that one man's, uh, one person's uh, alien could be somebody else's demon or angel. We don't really know what these beings are. 
We just know they're not us. And um, there's quite a bit of evidence to suggest that it's something uh, non-human. Um, but I don't know anybody who has an actual answer. And aliens, if you mean space aliens, there are a lot of folks who do not think that that is the answer. And in fact, a lot of other people who think that it might be more than one answer, that we might be talking about a, a several different kinds of entities. Uh, so thanks for the call. and Thanks for sharing your perspective. Uh, we're going to go to Cornelius in Louisiana. Hi, Cornelius. What's on your mind? Hey there, George and Chris. And that Ken guy that was just on, that's Project Blue Bean. So you can look up Project Blue Bean. Oh, yeah. um, I was just telling Donna Walker, the call screener, George, you've been spotlighted on News Nation and everything. And I'm going to call Chucky Schumer and Tim uh, Burgess and tell them, you know, we need to get on top of this. But I'm like Ken to a certain extent. I'm the God, guns, and gold man, the Bible, bullets, and beans man. So I think it's a <laughs> demonic deception that they're going to do on us. But if you read the Bible, Ezekiel saw a wheel within a wheel, and Jacob's ladder, he saw angels ascending and descending. But I can't wait till disclosure. And George, you and Art Bell, and of course George Norway, all three of y'all have been on top of this. I wish Art Bell was still alive to see all of this come through. So God bless you, George Knapp. And Chris, like I said, I think they, they're going to try to disclose this stuff. Thank you. Thanks, Cornelius. You know, I yeah, I wish Art Bell were still around as well. Um, I, I, just to reiterate, because uh, it sort of touches on what Ken, the previous caller, said about angels, demon, demons, uh, other beings. We don't really know the answers to the big questions about who the non-human intelligence might be. So I don't close the door on any of this stuff. You know, some of these beings have not uh, behaved in a really friendly way. We don't know what the long-term intentions of some of them, let alone all of them, might be. Right, Chris? Absolutely, yeah. I, I take the same opinion as you. And I think that we're talking about various intelligences some may be from this planet even, um, and some may be from other dimensions and other planets. So I, I think we may be dealing with a whole host of things. I mean, we're dealing, you know, l life and nations and powers are so complex on this Earth alone. But now we're dealing with the whole universe. So I, I think... You know, we, we can't really simplify it. I, I think it is inevitably going to be complex. Well, as, I, as we've said earlier tonight, no one that we know has the answers to the really big questions. Who they are, where they're from, why they're here, what their interest is in us. There might be multiple answers to each of those questions, and any one of them could be pretty disturbing. It's a lot to absorb in a short amount of time. I know for people who follow this avidly, they can't get the answers soon enough. They feel it's really gone pretty slowly. Uh, for me, who's been at it for a long time, it seems to be amazingly fast. I don't know what your perspective on uh, that is, on, about how quickly change has happened. But Yeah, and that's one other thing that I, I kind of feel a little bit uneasy about because there seems to be a sense of urgency. And you sometimes ask yourself, is there something happening that we should be a little bit worried about. Um, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but there, there does seem to be an uptick in urgency, and that is something I have noticed. You mentioned to us about the call from the guy in Cornwall. Can you give us a hint about what other directions your reporting is going to take in the in the near future without uh, 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 sort of spilling the beans on scoops that you might have in the works? Yeah, yeah, of course. So, <clears throat> I mean, I'm going to look to report this more from a UK level. I think the steps now being taken from the US government, I, I, I think really it's it's becoming a situation where the, the UK government really has to take action um, or otherwise risk being left behind. So I, I think I'm going to investigate this more from a UK perspective um, in the coming months. But also I think it's going to be more of the same in terms of following all the latest um, all the latest news from the U.S., which is where, which is where all the action is happening right now. Um, but also think as well that the spotlight is going to fall a lot more on the contractors as well in terms of this Lockheed. So I'm not finished 
with that aspect of the story as well. So there may be more to come from that angle, let's say. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.